God so loved the world that he did what? Gave. Did you know that God gave to you before you've ever talked about giving to God or even thought about it? And so today, we're going to call our ushers forward this morning on Resurrection Sunday. Listen, challenge the world with that. Today's not Easter. Did y'all know that's a pagan holiday? I'm serious. It's not Easter. You know, that word was only used one time in the book of Acts, and it was referencing a holiday that was not even associated to Jesus Christ. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Resurrection Sunday. That's what today is. But here's what I want to to challenge you with. God gave to you by sending His Son. The opportunity is there if you're not serving the Lord for you to be saved. And I'm not saying, don't misunderstand my words, I'm not saying that you give money to God to get any. You can't buy nothing from God. But we do it because He gave to us. And so this morning, you know, the Bible does declare 10% is tithe of all of our income. But He also talks about offering. There's envelopes in front of you there, and we want to welcome everybody else that's online with us live right now too to know that you're welcome in the giving. God gave to you, you can give back to Him. And if we feed you, meaning if our ministry ministers to your heart, then you're, listen to this, you're required by God. That's what Scripture teaches. You're required by God to give to the place where you're fed. It says that in Malachi, to bring all of your tithe and offering to the storehouse. That's where you're fed. All right, And so those online, if we feed you, then you need to give to the house of the Lord. And so here's what I would say to you today. On the back of the envelope, if you're present in this building, you'll see a tithe envelope. There's different slots there. If it's your tithe, don't put it in one of those locations that's listed there. Make sure it's marked tithe. But if you want to give offering to those locations, you're more than welcome to, and we would encourage you to do so. You'll be amazed what will happen in your heart and in your life even around you when you start giving to God consistently. It's amazing what takes place. Why would I give the money that I've been given to God? Because He wants your whole heart, friend. And you may not even realize it, but holding on to that money and thinking that it's yours means that you're still holding on to parts of your life and your heart that should belong to Him. Jesus says where your treasure is is your heart also. And so give today as God tells you to. If you're here in the house and you don't want to do a tithing envelope or you don't bring cash, we like cash, but you don't have to do it that way. We made it easy for you. You can text right here as you see on the screen. Text CAG, which is Cornerstone Assembly of God. CAG to 76959. Save that number in your phone so you can use it all the time. You don't have to be here to use it. You can use it anywhere. In fact, I'd encourage you, unless your Bible is on the phone, I'd encourage you to use your device right now. This is the one time you can do it. You got my permission. Use it in church and text CAG to 76959. It'll send you a link back. Follow the links and give. It'll actually pop up a deal that looks just like that envelope, and you'll be able to put in whatever you need to put in there. If you don't want to do it that way, you can go to our website, cornerstoneatlanta.tv. That could be on your phone or on a web thing later. You can save your card information on our website, and it's safe. That's how my wife and I do everything that we do is through a website. And so make sure you do this. Give to God and be obedient to what he's saying to you. Amen? Amen. Y'all bow your heads with me. I'll be some nice-looking young ladies up here. Y'all breathe. I'm not going to ask one of y'all to pray. You're all right. Praise God. Y'all bow your heads and let's pray today. Father, we love you and we thank you. And I ask you now as one of the highest forms of worship that we could participate in, let us give to the kingdom of God. Lord, we'll put our resources in so many locations that are never going to amount for anything in eternity. But I ask that you'd speak to every one of us right now. What would we do for your kingdom? Lord, let us give today as you would tell us to give. Bless this gift, multiply it to meet the needs of your kingdom. But also, Lord, we pray that you would use this to reach people and do the ministry, but then also bless the ones that are giving. You promised that you would do that. You're reaping and sowing God. So today, let them see you move in their lives in the near future as they're obedient to your voice and they give to God. We thank you for it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give as the Lord instructs you to this morning.
ahead and stand with me for the reading of the Word of the Lord. John chapter 11, are you there? If you can't find it, St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John chapter 11. That means it's right behind 10. It's right before 12. You guys are Bible scholars. Look at there. Beginning in verse 18, I know that this is probably not a normal Resurrection Sunday message, but I'm being obedient to what I have felt on my heart for the last couple of weeks and the direction that the Holy Spirit told me to preach. But I think by the time it's all over with, you're going to catch a common theme in this story here, and you're going to see that it does all fit in to what we celebrate today with the resurrection of our Lord. Beginning in verse 18, the word of the Lord says this, Now Bethany was close or nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, which measures out around two miles in our measurements today. And many of the Jews came to Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. And Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said unto her, listen to this, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, not the assemblies, not Pastor Josh, he that believeth in me, he says, though he were dead, yet he will what? Live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Did you know when you go to the funeral of a saint, they're not dead? Listen, it says it right here. When you go to the funeral of a saint, they're not dead. If you believe on him, you're alive and you'll never die, Scripture says. You may close the eyes of this body, but you're alive and you're with him forevermore. It goes on and it says this. Do you believe this? Did you know that's really what it all comes down to? Do you believe what I'm telling you today? about this man we call Jesus. She said unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. When she had said so, or when she had said this to him, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The Master has come and calls for thee. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and she came to him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews, which were in the house, or, or with her at the house, comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, they followed her and said that she goes up to the grave to weep. Then when Mary came to where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell down at his feet and said, Lord, this is funny, she says it too, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Isn't it interesting that the human response to tragedy is to blame God? Two times in this passage. Where were you, Lord? He's still watching and seeing it all. Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping. The Jews were also weeping with her. And Jesus, look at this, groaned in his spirit, and he was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, say these two words with me. Jesus wept. You just learned a Bible verse. Jesus wept. Look at that. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Talking of Lazarus and Jesus. Some of them said, Cannot this man which opened up the eyes of the blind have not caused this to even take place where he wouldn't have died? Again, the human blaming the Lord. Jesus, therefore, again groaning within himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone was laid upon top of it. Well, this all sounds familiar. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he'll stink. Because he's been dead for four days. Lazarus was a you know, believer. He believed in God. He was dead. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Some of you believe in the Lord, but right now your life stinks. And it smells bad to God. And He wants you to come out of that grave today. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if you would believe, you'd see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 
And I know that thou always hears me, but because of thy people which stand by, I said it, that they would know and believe that you have sent me. When he thus spoke and he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them that were standing there, Loose him and let him go. I want to preach to you this morning for a few moments. Out of verse 25 in your Bibles would be red letters that Jesus said, I am what? The resurrection and the life. Bow your heads with me. Father, we ask you now to anoint my lips. Anoint everything I say today, God. Lord, there's people in this building that have no idea what I'm about to talk about, but I need your help. My words aren't going to plant a display in front of them. It's not going to help them visualize it. It's going to be your anointing that does that. So touch me with your spirit today, Lord. From the top of my head all the way down to my feet, let the Spirit of God just resonate in this building to sinner, backslider, saint, everybody. Let us, let us understand where we are with you today. And by faith, I proclaim as a man of God, so and so, man, woman, child, come forth out of your grave today. Touch your people, Lord, on this day that we celebrate your resurrection. Let the Spirit that resurrected you from the dead resurrect some people here today. Touch us by your power. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. <coughs> if y'all see me going to this cup right here, it's not coffee. When I stir it, it's because I'm trying to mix up this water and this nasty lemon juice and this honey, and it is terrible. But it cleans off my vocal cords. So, ooh, that was real bad. No. Oh. Mm. Now, I know this might not be a location that you would think we would preach from on the resurrection of the Lord, but it's uh, something that God's been speaking in my heart. I want to paint the picture for you of where Jesus is at and what's about to take place. You still here today? Let me just make sure you're with me, amen? Here's what we do. Two weeks from this moment in John chapter 11, Jesus is going to be crucified. He's preparing for that day. We're one week away from where we were last week, where he rides in on the, the back of a donkey on the, what we call the triumphal entry of the Lord. He's about a week and a half away from the two weeks ago that I preached to you about washing the feet of the disciples. But it seems to me before he left, he wanted everybody to know how much he loved mankind. You see it through the foot washing. You see it through the personal interaction of Jesus at the Last Supper with those hundred and uh, probably the 120 that went to the upper room at Pentecost like he told them to. He's interacting on a personal basis with all of these individuals, but he's still on his mind knowing that the time is coming. He's already told them very clearly, my time is growing short. I'm about to depart. And you don't understand what I'm telling you, but I'm going to tear the temple down, speaking of his body, where God lives in every one of us, and in three days I'll raise it back up. Now the non-spiritual people couldn't understand it. They thought he was talking about the building. They were calling him blasphemer. And they were saying all kinds of things. He said he was going to tear down the temple of God. That's not what he was speaking of. He was speaking of himself dying on the cross and resurrecting on the third day. And where that's what the whole story is all about, I don't want to preach to you about that story today, although you're going to hear a lot of stuff about that story because that's where all the power comes from to preach about your story today that you're going to hear about, about him bringing you back from the dead. That's what this is all about. Jesus died that you could live. Did you know that? That's what Scripture says very clearly. It says it that by one man's disobedience, speaking of Adam, it says through his disobedience, Jesus came, all men died, but it says through the second man, Jesus, he, through his obedience, all of us can be saved. That's exactly what Christ did for every one of you, and myself included. But I want to focus on some things in this passage that I think clarify how important the resurrection is 
to me and you. How important it is that Jesus would die on the cross. And we see a glimpse of all of that right here in this story of Lazarus dying and being raised from the dead. So if you're writing notes and on the back of your bulletin, there's a space for you to do that. If you don't write notes or you want a copy of mine, you're welcome to them after the service. But the very first thing I want you to write down or remember this morning is this about the story with Lazarus. We see that Jesus Christ has a love for mankind that we don't understand. He loves you. Did you hear me this morning? Jesus loves you. I can't understand the depth of His love. I don't understand how it was that when He was on a cross, He thought about me and you, but He loves you. And He loves me. And I want to clarify that today before I move forward, that He thinks about you all the time. You're on His mind. From the moment you wake up to even while you're asleep, you're on the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you with an unfailing love and an unconditional love. Where we as humans may try to hold our love back from someone because of something they've done to us or hurt us somehow, God never does that to you. He loves you with an unfailing love. There's an old song, if I could sing it, I would sing it to you this morning. But it says this, Oh, how He loves you and me. Y'all know that old song? He gave His life. What more could He give? Oh, how He loves you. Oh, how He loves me. Oh, how He loves you and me. If you don't know that old one, there's another one. You probably sang it even though you was a heathen. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. You know these things. This is what the whole story is all about. How much He loves you. Was He pleased with everything in your life? Probably not. But it doesn't remove His love. So for the next few moments, I want to talk about how much Jesus loves you in this story. We see it right here beginning with this thought as we start out looking at John chapter 11. Number one about His love for you is that Jesus will go out of His way for you. What do you mean He'll go out of His way for me, preacher? Consider again what I led in with a moment ago. Two weeks from now, what's Jesus about to do? He's about to be crucified. You don't think he's got a lot going on in his mind? You better read a few chapters later when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. He's got a lot on his mind. He's got emotional things going on because he's in a human body. Was he God? Yes, he was fully God. But he laid his God nature, his deity, aside, and he never used it while he was in a human body. He was the Son of Man, but He was the Son of God. But He took off His godliness, put it to the side, and let the Spirit lead Him just like we're to be led. But He was overwhelmed with emotion. Read in that chapter, later on on your own time, how He prayed in the garden, saying, Lord, take this cup from me if I don't have to drink of it. Don't let me be crucified. Don't let me die in this manner. But He would continue to pray and say, Nevertheless, Lord, not my will be done, but Thine be done. So Jesus had a lot going on. Not only that, he was trying to keep his disciples together. Because here's what I've seen in ministry. When the master goes away, sometimes all the mice like to start playing. You don't think for one second that when Jesus left, Peter thought he was going to be somebody? You don't think for one second that Thomas and Matthew and Bartholomew and all of those that were there and James and John and their mama who went and talked to Jesus one time about their status in the kingdom, you don't think that when Jesus died, they were all thinking, huh, it's my turn now, buddy. So Jesus was trying to keep his guys together. That's what the feet washing was all about. Telling them, look, the church depends on you just like today it depends on you guys. You're the church. But it all depends on you, not me. If I go away, this thing should be better than it was when I was here. You guys should be able to maintain it all. You guys should be carrying it all. That's the church. The church is not one man. The church is built on the foundation of Christ. But Jesus goes out His way for me and you. He's got all of these things going on in His mind and in His heart, and He's overwhelmed. But listen to this. Notice, here's what we see in the passage. As soon as He heard Lazarus was dead, He made plans to get moving in that direction. Something that's interesting to me, though, as I was reading this this week and praying about how to approach this, I saw this part in there. It says that He had been dead for a couple of days. And Jesus specifically told His disciples, we're not going yet. 
You know what I think that tells me and you? You need to quit worrying about what's going on in your life. Because God knew about it two days ago. Did you hear that? And he's not worried about it because he knows what he's coming down there to do. So you don't have to worry about what's going on in your life. We catch a glimpse right here. Jesus even told them, he's not sick, he sleeps. He's dead. I know the situation. I know what's going on. And there's not a thing in your life today that God's not aware of. He knows where you're at. He knows where you sleep. He knows where you shouldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the door right now. He knows the number of hairs upon your head. Charles, even where they used to be. What am I trying to tell you this morning? I'm trying to tell you that Jesus is such a personal Jesus. He's someone that wants to be your friend. Did you know that? Proverbs even says it. It doesn't just say he wants to be your friend. He said he'll be a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. I ain't have no brothers. I wish I would have, but I can't change that now. Lord, if I put that on my mama, she'd hate me the rest of her life if she had a boy right now. But here's the thing. Where I ain't have no family or no brothers, I wish I'd have had somebody standing with me. I ended up with brothers like Tyrone and some other people, and they were good, but it wasn't blood. You understand what I'm saying? And so here's the thing. Man, Jesus said, I will be with you closer than any brother in your life would ever be there. You know what it means? He will be closer to you than your own blood. Some of us need to get that today because some of us worship our families more than we worship. I'm serious. Some of you are already thinking about lunch right now because you want to go spend time with your family more than you want to spend time in the presence of God. Jesus said, your family can't even come between him and you. You know this gospel has cost me my family? I'm not proud of that. It has cost me people that I dearly care about. But nothing can come between me and my Savior. Nothing can come between me and my gospel. Nothing can come between me and this Word. But Jesus will go out of His way for me and you. Listen, do you do understand that Jesus didn't even have to go to the grave to raise Lazarus from the dead? You do realize that, don't you? Think back to the story of the Roman centurion. He comes to Jesus. He says, Lord, you don't need to come to my house. He told him, he said, I'll come. I will, I will heal your daughter. I will come over there and do whatever you need me to do with that kid. And, and he looked at the master and said, Lord, I'm a man that knows authority. Listen, all you have to do is speak the word. And it'll happen. And Jesus stops. That caught his attention. He said, in all of Israel, have I never found faith like this man? He just says simply, go home. She's healed. What we'd say today is it's all good. It's taken care of. Jesus didn't even have to go to the grave of Lazarus. You know what that tells me about this personal connection that he wants with me and you? Jesus didn't go to the grave because he had to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. Jesus went to the grave because he loved Lazarus and he loved the people that were mourning about the death of Lazarus. He went out of his way on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to the cross of Calvary to die for all of humanity's sin, he stopped for a moment, put it into his schedule. I don't know, he didn't have a cell phone, he didn't have Google calendars, which I live off of now, God forbid, but he didn't have none of that, but he broke up his schedule to make sure that he was right where the people needed him to be. Why? Not because he was their pastor or because he was their good shepherd. He went there because Jesus loved them. Jesus loves you. I'm not talking about American Jesus. The Jesus that we've built a culture around that nobody worships. You got people that wear crosses that don't even know what it means. People that hold trophies up and say, I think my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they don't know because their life doesn't reflect that they really know Him. I'm not talking about that Jesus. I'm talking about the Jesus in the book that you're hearing about right now. The one that will go out of his way to make sure that you get what you need. He'll go out of his way to minister to you wherever you find yourself. It tells me this about him. You, listen to this carefully, guys. You are a personal matter to Jesus. Don't you like that today? Not only does Jesus care about the affairs going on in your life, but he went out of his way to leave heaven 
He, he became a man, died on a cross, resurrected himself from the dead. Think about all of that. Just so you could be forgiven of everything that you've ever done, everything you're going to do, so you could be with him for all of eternity. That's how much he cares about you. Number two, the thing, uh, uh, second thing I want to show you about how much Jesus cares about you this morning, you learned a Bible verse. What was that Bible verse a moment ago? Look at you guys, man. Y'all are growing already. Jesus wept. If this doesn't speak volumes about the Master, I don't know what does. Keep in mind that Jesus wasn't crying because of the death of Lazarus. He was because He loved Lazarus. But He was going to resurrect Him from the dead. He already knew that. So he wasn't crying because Lazarus had lost his life like many people cry about. Jesus was crying because he loved the man Lazarus and he loved the ones that loved Lazarus and they were moved and they were being hurt by this situation and this tragedy that was going on in their life. So Jesus cried alongside with them because he hurt about the situation. This reveals something very intriguing about our Savior, about our Lord, about our Master. Keep in mind all of these things as he knows what he's about to do. He was crying because of these other people crying. Scripture tells us this in other locations. At another time in, in, the, in the Gospels, it says that Jesus looked upon the multitudes and he was moved with compassion. One time he was preaching, probably like some of you, and if I could multiply fish, I would do it for you right now. But he was preaching on the side of a mountain. Jesus probably went four or five hours a day doing this. And when he did it, he looked on them and he had, it says he had compassion on them because they hungered. And he said, bring them all up here, put them in companies. What do we have? We know a boy brought five loaves, two fishes. Jesus multiplies it. They have seven baskets left over when it's all done. But Jesus, I want you to get all of this today. He cried that day because he was moved with compassion about their situation. You know and realize that God oversees the affairs of the earth, but he oversees the affairs of your life too. He knows when you hurt. He knows when you cry. He knows. We sang about it this morning. He knows every tear that's falling from your eye. He knows everything about your life. And what we see here is that, that Jesus is touched, according to what it says in the book of Hebrews, with the feelings of our infirmities. What does that mean, preacher? Well, that's a big word. It means that He is still moved with compassion about your situation. If you're sick, He's not sick. He's got the answer because He is the answer. But He hurts with you. If you're going through a moment in your life where things are difficult or confused, things aren't difficult with Him and He's not confused because He's the answer to all your difficulties and He's the answer to all your confusion. But He chooses to feel what you're feeling in that moment. You know why he would empathize with you instead of sympathize? You know what sympathy is? Sympathy is to have pity for somebody. Empathy is to have pity with somebody. Big difference. He wants to feel what you feel because he wants you to realize how much he loves for you and that he is the only answer for your situation. So Jesus wept. He's there. He's moved by compassion. What did I say already over and over? And I'm going to continue to say it this morning. Jesus loves you. Go ahead and say it. Jesus loves me. Not me, you. You understand what I'm saying? Say that. Everybody, Jesus loves me. Do you believe that? And where these are personal benefits of the love of Christ, let me turn your attention now to the love of Christ for all of mankind. These hot tears flowing down the face of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus were not only just for Lazarus and those that were in mourning that were standing there, I believe that this death reminded Jesus of the curse upon the human race. I believe as He wept for Lazarus and He knew that the man died as a reflection of sin being in his body, not meaning that He did something and He died. That happens sometimes. But I'm saying that His body died because the sin curse upon mankind. What do you mean? In Romans 6 it says it. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Lazarus died because of sin. Not because he committed one thing that made him die, but because it's a part of all of us. We're all born into sin. I believe Jesus didn't just weep that day for the one standing there. I believe that day he wept for all of us, realizing what that curse did to mankind. 
It robbed us of the glory of God. It robbed us of the mind of God. It says in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 that we were created in the image and the likeness of God. We had, that was taken away. The moment, like Romans says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That moment took all of that away in the garden. And until we get saved and we accept Christ, do we only then start seeing it and getting a portion of it again and something in us awakens when we get saved and, and if you continue to grow, more and more of the glory of God is revealed in your life. But I believe Jesus is weeping because He's thinking about mankind. He's thinking about two weeks from now what He's about to do. It might not have just been tears of mourning about the, 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 the spiritual condition of humanity. He may have been weeping victory tears that day. Who knows what was going on in the mind of the Lord except Him. But He may have very well been weeping, saying, you know what? All of this is going to be over in two weeks from now. I believe that he also stood there that day. Personal Jesus stood there that day looking at those people crying about the death of Lazarus. Lazarus was probably not the only one in that tomb. Probably dead, decayed bodies. Very possible skeletons that have been decayed for years in that tomb. And as he stands there, tears flowing down his face. I believe that Jesus, because we just saw how personal he is to come to where you are and to weep with you and to feel what you feel. I believe that Jesus was thinking back to Genesis chapter 1. That in the beginning, God spoke. And he said, let us make man in our image. I believe Jesus was weeping as he remembered Adam being formed. I believe he was weeping as he remembered, as God would breathe into the nostrils of Adam, it says in Genesis, that he would become a living soul. I believe that Jesus is going all the way back there, and he's realizing what took place, and he's also weeping because of the decision Adam would make later. You see, church, the tears that flowed that day in John chapter 11, I believe flowed when God looked upon his work and called it good. I believe he wept over his creation with joy. I believe that the tears that flowed, flowed again, just like in John 11. They flowed again whenever Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. That's the compassionate God that we serve. I believe He wept in the garden when He put them out and told them, you can't come back anymore. I believe that God wept again. Listen to this. When tears flowing down His face, I believe Jesus was weeping when He was forsaken on the cross and He looked up to heaven and said, Eloi, Eloma, Loma Sabachthani, meaning, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I believe tears flowed down the face of the Lord Jesus Christ again whenever He mustered whatever life was left in His body hanging on a cross at those very last moments. He didn't thirst. He didn't have anything going on except me and you in His mind. And I believe with tears flowing down His face again, He would look up to heaven and He would pronounce the greatest three words that still echo in eternity today. And flowing down His face, tears rolling for me and you, He would say, It is finished and he would give up the ghost is anybody hearing this god's love for mankind runs so much deeper than me and you are ever going to realize until we're in the fullness of his presence one day but this day at the tomb was much more than a display of love that god has for me and you he also reveals his plan at that grave for me and you did you know that there's a picture of salvation at this tomb of a dead man named Lazarus. What does it mean that we see the plan of salvation? Well, when he's talking to Martha, there's some interesting dialogue that takes place in John 11. I want to read it to you again, verses 21 to 27. Have you key in on this? Listen. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know now that even now, whatever you ask of God, He'll give it to you. And Jesus said to her, my brother, or your brother, will rise again. Martha said to Him, I know that He's going to rise again at the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said unto her, what? I am the resurrection and the life. Isn't it funny how we look for events, but we don't look to the event maker? 
He said, you don't need a day for that to happen because I am that day. You don't need to wait for that day because I am standing right in front of you. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he will what? Live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me will never die. Believest thou this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God. Martha was trying to have faith. I'm finna get in your house now. Y'all ready for this one? Listen, I'm finna get right in. I'm finna stir that Kool-Aid up. Some of it settled down in your cup, and it's time to shake it back up. All right? We finna sweeten it for you today. I grew up with sugar, that, or Kool-Aid had no sugar. That was terrible stuff. Where I grew up in L.A., you laughing because we had flavor aid, didn't we? We didn't have Kool-Aid. <laughs> what brings back some memories? We ran around with these Ziploc bags with Kool-Aid mixed in them. We thought we were somebody. We couldn't afford Fun Dip. The stuff was 25 cents. We couldn't afford it. We didn't have a quarter. We made Fun Dip. Forget y'all. We just couldn't eat the stick because we was using a stick off the ground. Y'all got that nice little white stick. Yeah. <laughs> I done lost the anointing. Hallelujah. Where in the world did that come from? Fun Dip. Praise God. <laughs> Martha was trying to have faith. Her brother had died. Easy to have faith when everything's going wrong. It's easy to have faith, preacher. We look at you, you smile all the time, you never have any problems. <laughs> Go switch places with me for a day. I bet you run back to yours thanking God for your problems. Trust me. Brother was dead. Jesus is now present. Don't be holy this morning when I say what I'm about to say. But I can guarantee you there was a lot of doubt and frustration in Martha's mind. We see it. She expresses that frustration. Mary does the same thing. So does the crowd that's standing there. If he's really the Christ, he wouldn't have let him die. You see what I'm getting at here? She says, Lord, if you weren't here, this wouldn't have happened. Very human of all of us. How many times, I'm not asking you to agree with me right now, Brother Door. I may have to preach at you for a little bit. But how many times do we wonder, God, what are you doing? Why weren't you here two days ago? We start shaking a fist at him, Brother Door, and we start saying, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. As if God got off the throne. As if he ever left heaven. As if something slipped by. As if the enemy snuck past God, tippy-toeing or using some type of fairy dust or something. I think Walt Disney's a good thing for kids, but I think he's messed up our imaginations about the devil a little bit. I think we have this idea that he's a fictional character that runs around sneaking past God. He ain't sneaking past anybody. That adversary's still a subject to God. He still answers to God. And God knows everything that goes on in the earth. There's nothing he doesn't know. But get this. We gotta quit blaming God for what's going on and we need to start praising him for what he's gonna do. Did you hear what I just said? That's what he's trying to get Martha to. Do you believe what I can do? And that's the problem. You know what Martha does? Here's something very human. She becomes spiritual. She wasn't spiritual before this. She was blaming him for what happened. But now she gets spiritual. You know what she does? He said, do you believe I can do this? I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe that? Oh, she starts quoting Scripture to Jesus. What do you mean? Well, Lord, it says. Where do you think it says that? that he's going to come back at the resurrection one day. So she starts quoting Scripture to Jesus and telling him, you know, well, the book says that this is what's going to happen. Let me tell you something today. Just because you can quote Scripture doesn't mean you believe what it says. However, one of you learned a Bible verse today already. Jesus wept. But until you start believing that he's there weeping with you, it means nothing. Until you really understand the power of what that is about how personal he wants to be in your life and you start yielding to him in a personal relationship and allowing him into the things of your life, you'll never know what it really means. Therefore, you don't believe it. He looks at her and he says, do you really believe this? Oh, yes, Lord, I'm holy and I'm, I can tell you what the Scripture says. It's funny how all that happens. That's another message I'll preach another time for you. But listen to me, Jesus is not pleased with how much Scripture you know or how much Scripture you can quote. He needs you to believe Scripture. 
He needs you to believe what it says. That's where the power of it is. He tells Martha that he's the resurrection and the life. Not that the book just says that there's going to be a resurrection one day. He needs you to believe it. You see, church, we got to get that today about the Bible. There's nothing we can do to change wherever we're at. But what we can do is find what God says about where we're at, and we can believe that he can change where we're at. That's what the book says, and that's what we have to believe, and we got to get back to that place. If there's something I could tell you that he's trying to get in Martha's head, are you still here, church? I want to make sure you ain't losing this right now. But listen, if there's one thing the church needs to hear about what he told Martha and he told Mary, he says, do you believe this? And then he turns and he says, I am the resurrection. You know what he was telling her? Just like he told Peter when Peter got out of the boat and he started sinking when he wasn't looking at who? Jesus, he's trying to tell Martha, don't get your eyes on everything else around you. Keep your eyes on me. That'll preach. JB, write that down so you can preach it later. Carter, I'm not talking to you. He got a tie just like me. That is not cool. (laughs) We both must have went to the dollar store yesterday. Hallelujah. He tells her, get her hope off of everything else and put it on him because he's the resurrection and the life. She then responds with some very powerful things about Jesus. Look what she says when he says, do you really believe this? (laughs) She says, yes, I believe that you're my Lord, you're the Christ, and you're the Son that was to come into the world. Oh, you got to get it. She got it now. She understood what he was saying. It's not about what the book says. It's what I believe the book says. And she answered and she responded with this statement about the plan that God wants to do in our life. She said, you're the son of God that has come into the world. That's the promise given to every one of us. That one day there'd be a baby born to a virgin. He wasn't celebrated like we celebrated in our culture, but he was born in a manger. The world rejected him. But anybody that lets their spirit open up will accept him. And he came into the earth as the Son of God to save mankind. She said, you're the Christ. You know what that means to a Jewish person? That you're the Messiah. You're the anointed one that can do miracles. That's what it means. She's now saying, not only are you the Savior, but you're the one that can do anything in my life. Oh, she's getting it now. She's understanding what he wanted her to understand. And then she said, you're the Lord. You know what that tells me? That we have to surrender to his Lordship. You were bought with a price. You're not your own. Do you know when the biggest struggle happens in your life? Some of you had not been to church except today since last year. And you know why? Because you're still the Lord of your life instead of Jesus being the Lord. Do you know what happens when it's those terms? Think about if you owned a home, or you didn't own a home. Let me reverse that. Say you rented a home and you had a landlord. You can't just do anything you want to with his house. You can't go build a room onto the house because it belongs to him and then go give him a ticket and say, you owe me this. You have to ask permission. He's your Lord. There's regulations and things that you abide by that are agreed to in a contract and a covenant between the two of you when you have a landlord. That's how it works. How do we not get this in Christianity? How do we not understand that when we get saved, we're not just having a Savior, we're to have a Lord and we're to be at His Lordship? That He's supposed to be the master of our life making every decision. Telling us where to go, telling us what to do, telling us how to do it, how to spend it, what needs to be done, so he gets the glory. Oh, preacher, you're talking like we have to be fanatics. Well, what else would you be? Don't you think that Jesus was a little fanatical over you? To die on the cross, just so he could become your Lord. But not only did we hear Martha reveal the plan of God, we see the plan of God in itself as Jesus stands outside the tomb. What do you mean, preacher? I'm closing down. I promise I'm on the last page. Listen, here's the first thing that we see about the plan of God. Number one, Jesus is the only source of life. Jesus, did you hear me, church? Jesus is the only source of life. Jesus gives life. Jesus told him, where's the body? Take it to me. Where is he laid at? It's very similar if you'll go look back in Genesis when Adam and Eve fell. Genesis chapter 3. God walks through the garden just like he did every day. And he walks down and he says, where art thou, man? Where are you, Adam? Same thing at John 11. He's saying it again. Where is he at? Tell me where he is. Did the master have to be told where he was? No, he was God. 
He knew where he was. He wanted to go to where he was. He went to where this man was. The body was laying down. And as he stands outside the tomb, he doesn't just say, man, come forth. He says, Lazarus, come forth. Why? Two reasons. Number one, there was probably a bunch of dead bodies in that grave. And he had so much power because he was God, he could have just said, get up. And there probably been hundreds of bodies that come walking out of that grave that day. But you know what it tells me again, going back to personal Jesus. He knows where you're at. He, if you're in a grave right now, if you're walking in a cave right now in your life, he's not standing out there saying Lazarus or Joshua. He's looking in there saying your name and saying, come out of there. I feel like I need to say this. Quit asking him to come into your cave because he's not going to do it. Quit asking him to come into your present situation and fix it. You know what you're doing? Come on my terms and do it my way. He didn't go into the tomb with Lazarus. He called him out of the tomb, out of the situation. You know what that means? That means when he calls your name, you can't just stand there today. When he speaks to your spirit, you can't not respond today because you'll leave in the same condition that you were before. And I plead with you, don't let it be that way. When the master calls your name, it doesn't guarantee he's going to call it again. You do get that. Lazarus had one moment to get up and come out. Oh, does this unconditional love of God guarantee that He loves us without fail? Yes, but I don't know how many times He's going to call your name. Today is the day of salvation. It's what it says. When He speaks to you, it's time. He may not have time to walk by the next time. There's 7 billion people He's concerning Himself with. But He'll still call your name in your grave and try to give you life. Jesus is the only source of all of this. And at the command that Christ gave and said, Lazarus, get up. He got up. And he came out of the situation. And he came to Jesus. And things changed. You still here? Everybody? I'm still going to preach the rest. Here we go. Two more things. Number one. Or number two, sorry. First one is Jesus is the only source of life. Number two, that's salvation, right? It's a picture of salvation. I told you the plan of God. He's the only one that gives life. I am the resurrection and the life. Number two, check this out. Jesus is the only thing that can clean us up. Quit telling people you'll go to church when you get right. Did you die on the cross? Did you resurrect from the dead? Then you can't fix yourself. Quit thinking so much of yourself. You know what you're saying when you do that? You're saying, God, I'm God, and I got it. I don't need what you're offering me. Jesus will clean us up. You know what we call that? It's a big word, and the church is called sanctification. Well, it's a big old word, isn't it? You know what it means? He'll clean us up. That's Him working in our life. How many of you, when you got saved, became perfect? You're all dirty sinners. None of us are perfect when we get saved. Man, we should have a perfect heart towards God. We shouldn't want to sin. He's trying to get us out of that life. He's calling us away from it. But we see that every day God wants to work and clean us up more and more in our life. Some of us, it might take a little bit longer. Some of us might get a whole bunch of it at one time and some more at another time. I don't know how God picks all of that. I just know it's how it works. How do I know that Jesus can clean us up? Listen to what he said. He said, bring him out and get the clothes off of his body. You know what that's telling me? Get all the stuff. Man, this is so good. I want y'all to hear this. Listen, you got to see me right now. You can't, I'm too short. You can't see me down there. Him telling them to take off the grave clothes. My Lord, are y'all ready for this? It's telling them, take off everything that associated you to that old grave. Mm, everything that was a part of that old life, you got to get rid of it. You can't talk the same anymore. You can't act the same anymore. You can't look the same anymore. You can't be the same anymore. It's time to take off those grave clothes and walk in newness of life. I said it earlier. 
I need to talk to him instead of y'all. Brother Dor. <laughs> Some of the visitors think I'm paranoid. You know why I turn around and talk to Brother Dor? Because some of you can't take it when I'm talking to you. So, Brother Dor, look here. You stink sometimes. Not, hey, I ain't, what's the world say? I ain't judging. You know why you stink? Because you're still wearing the same old stuff from the life that you came from. Some of you have got out of the grave and you've experienced a little bit of life. You've experienced the Master's hand. You've experienced the personal Jesus that I talked to you about a moment ago. But somehow you thought it would be okay to keep wearing the same old dirty clothes. What glorifies Jesus if I drink? Mm -hmm. It glorifies Jesus if I smoke. It glorifies Him if I continue to live the way I'm living. You know what? You stink, actually, because you're wearing the same old clothes. And He wants you to have some fine linen. And He wants you to put on the righteousness of God. Not your righteousness, because your righteousness is as filthy rags. But as long as you wear them filthy rags, you're going to stink to the rest of the world. Did you know the world that doesn't know God knows you stink when you stink? You know how I know that? Because they won't come to church because of the hypocrisy you live in. Oh, I'm preaching now. You know how I know? Some of y'all frowned at me. Don't be mad at me, honey. I'm not the offense. The gospel is. I'm trying to get you out of this stuff. You need to come out of that cave. You need to get out of that grave. Here's the thing. It's sad that when people that have experienced the hand of God, it's sad when they don't know they stink. But lost people know they stink. Isn't that terrible? And you are the thing keeping them from coming out of their grave. Is anybody hearing this today? We see the gospel presentation. You see in this, I'm not just making it up, guys. Jesus is the only source of life. Jesus says, clean them up. But guess this, the whole presentation's there. Not just get saved, not just clean them up. Discipleship is at that whole tomb too. What do you mean by that? Listen, Jesus expects, this is so good when you get it, Jesus expects the living to help the living. What do you mean by that? Read it. That last verse, whenever they come out and it says, get the grave clothes off of him. Can you put it up there, Tammy? I'm not, it's slipping my mind what verse that was. That last verse of the passage that I gave you. What is that? Verse 44, global warming. See, it's taking effect again. I couldn't remember it. Hallelujah. But look, that last verse, look what it says. Take the grave clothes off of him. He says, take off the napkin that was off of him. Jesus said unto who? Come on, to who? He ain't talking to Lazarus. He would have said him. He said, Jesus said to who? Had to be believers. Probably the same one that was standing there that said, Lord, I believe what you just said. Martha, Mary, I believe what you just said. All of this standing there. It means this. Listen, the gospel's not about just get them saved. It's about you getting in their life and helping them walk it out. He said, get the grave clothes off of them. Take it off of them. Notice, the master didn't do it. He expected the church to do it. Jesus could have walked up and took the clothes right off of Lazarus. But he said, church, you do this. Get your hands dirty. Get in there. You know why people won't do this in the church? Because they get their hands dirty. Well, them folks stink. Brother John, you ever felt grave clothes? You ever smell what they smell like? Whew. Boy, I could preach on this part right now. You know what? I do know what they smell like. Because I used to wear the same rags. I used to wear the same garment. Have we come so far that we've forgotten where we came from? Have we forgotten that one day somebody took our clothes off of us and helped us walk this thing out? We can't be so holy that we don't help them grow. Some of us thought, well, we got some age on us. We could retire from the church program. Shame on you. You don't ever retire from this. Jesus hasn't even retired from it. And He's the Savior of it all. He's still operating in your life. He's still moving in your life. He's still active inside of the life of cleaning us up. So He still expects you to be active in the process of what we call discipleship. Helping believers 
that are coming out of the tomb, helping them grow in the Lord. Come on, Miss Kylie, give them some hope today. Whoever you have, all your musicians, I don't know what y'all want to do. But see, too many of us are too busy to take somebody's grave clothes off. Well, you know, Brother Josh, I got to work. All of us have to work. Think as you got a job that you ain't got a job with the Lord? We're too busy. I really don't think that God's going to be happy with our leisure time and our hobbies if we do that more than we do His program. I'm sorry. I can't. I wish I could butter it up and make it a little more encouraging than that, but I'm here to tell you truth. And the truth is, is the American church has lost its way with God. We think that just showing up on Easter, Christmas, and Mother's Day is making Him happy when He ain't showed up in your heart on any of those days. We've got to come out of this grave. Come on, church, help me today. Truth will save you. Truth will change your life. Too many of us are too busy. Or we're too clean and holy and dignified to get involved with a prostitute or a drug addict or somebody that's come from another type of life of sin. You know what happens a lot of times? Because we have forgotten where we came from and because we don't participate in the sin that they participate in, we think that we're better and we're too clean. Don't forget, you used to wear grave clothes too. Oh, you might get dirty. You might even start stinking a little bit. But that's the gospel. Don't forget Jesus had grave clothes on when they put him in the tomb. They weren't his. You know whose grave clothes he was wearing? Ours. But I keep reading the story. And it says on a Sunday... On the first day of the week, that the stone rolled away. And old Peter went running down there because he still didn't believe what Jesus had told him. And he went running down there because he thought the body had been stolen. And they run in, and you know what it says they saw? Oh, Mary had a different look at it when she got to run in. But they ran in, and they saw the grave clothes all folded up sitting where they were, and they had wrapped Jesus up in our grave clothes three days prior to that. And they were off of him. And they were sitting there. I had somebody share something with me this weekend. I thought it would be applicable right now. They told me this. They said in their tradition, that when somebody took the clothes and folded them up, the master was saying, I'm done and I'm finished with what I need to do. Whew. Boy, that is good. The grave clothes were all folded up set where they laid his body, but he couldn't find a living among the dead because he was alive. Stand with me this morning. If you didn't hear anything else that I said today, I need you to concentrate on me right now. This is the life-changing moment right now. This is the moment where you can come out of where you are. You can finally break free. You don't just have to look at the light. You can walk in it today. Verse 25 in John chapter 11, the title of the message, Jesus said, I am the what? The resurrection and the life. He that believes in me. Though he were dead, he shall live. Everybody look at me. Jesus died on the cross for you. Every one of you, including myself. But it didn't stop there. Jesus resurrected for you so that you could live a new life here. John 10, it says it's an abundant life. If He promised such an abundant life, why is your life so miserable? Doesn't add up. He's already paid for it. You just got to withdraw it from the bank in heaven. It's that simple. He died for you. He loves you that much. 
If you could come up with a list and compile it today of all the sins that you've ever committed in your life. He's willing because he's already done it to forgive you if you just ask. You'd have a brand new life. But me preaching that to you in your cave where you stand doesn't mean that you have come out of that cave. You're going to have to take a step. Like Martha, I have to ask you like Jesus asked her, do you believe this? Because it's not just about what you can tell me about the book. It's about what you believe about the book. And if you believe that this story is true, then you got to walk out of your grave today. you got to get things right with God. That food will wait on you, I promise you. Your family's going to wait on you, I promise you. But I can't guarantee you He's going to wait on you for the rest of your life. I'm not God, I can't tell you that. Will He be there if you ask? You better believe it. But He's asking you right now. Did you ever think about that? The Master standing outside of your grave right now saying so-and-so, come forth. You're not having to ask Him because He's asking you to take a chance today and have new supply. The same power, according to the book of Romans, we're told that the same power that resurrected Christ from the dead will come and live inside of you today if you ask for it, and He will give you a brand new life. I don't know how He does it, but He does it. So I want everybody to bow their heads, please. Close your eyes. No one looking around the room. Just listen to the sound of my voice. I don't care what background you came from. Denominationally. It's not what I'm interested in. I'm not trying to convert you to my beliefs. I'm trying to convert you to the salvation message. That's what matters. But today you're in the house of God. And you know on Resurrection Sunday, you know He's calling out to you today. I don't care how many times you've done it. I don't care if you've never done it before. But today you feel something different happening inside of your stomach. That's your spirit. He's moving. He's speaking to you right now. But you feel Him and He's tugging. But you know what else? There's another tug there. That's your flesh. And it's telling you you don't have to do this. You can do it anywhere else. Friend, Lazarus had to walk out of the grave. You're going to have to walk out of yours. He's giving you the life and the ability to do it right now. But if today with heads bowed and eyes closed, you feel that the Master's tugging, He's speaking your name. And you know that you're not living a life for God. Now let me explain. I'm not saying that means you messed up last night and you made a mistake. I'm talking about you know that you have lived a pattern up to this point in your life that you know you're not living for God. You know it. And you want to come out of that situation today. And you want to make things right with God. Friend, don't you worry about the person standing next to you. You need to respond to the one that's calling your voice or your name right now. But if that's you with heads bowed, nobody's looking, just me, you, and God right now. And you say you want to do that. You want to get saved. On Resurrection Sunday, what a great day to do it on. But you want to give your life to God. And you want to serve Him. You want to take off those clothes. And you want to walk with Him in newness of life. You're tired of what you've been doing. But you want to walk in newness. If that's you, nobody's going to judge you today. Nobody's going to bother you. We, we need you to respond. If that's you, lift your hand real high where I can see it. Anybody on Resurrection Sunday saying, I want to be saved. Come on, I know that all of you aren't saved. I'm not trying to be ugly or draw it out of you, but respond today. Anybody? Anybody? For a few more moments. Don't fight. Let it happen today. The Master is calling your name. Anyone? Maybe today you're a saint meaning you've already been saved. But you know you've got some dirty clothes on. And then that's not the way that God wants to do it. Would you be bold enough to step out today and say, Lord, I don't want to wear these clothes anymore. I don't want it to be this way anymore. 
Right now, I want to open the altar for you. And say, if that's you and you know you haven't been living a life that pleases the God that you gave your life to, then today's a great day to come out of that cave and to stand in the light of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you make your way up here? Find you a place at these altars. And begin to ask God just to move in your life and to remove those dirty clothes off of you today. I feel like I need to ask this again. There's people that have responded. These altars are not for just salvation, guys. There's people that have already come up here today. But today, if the Lord is calling your name, I'm not trying to get a rise out of your response, but I really feel this in my spirit. If He's calling your name, and you know you need to get saved, and you need to give your life to Jesus today. Come up here right now. Don't hesitate. Come up here right now and let God change your life. Come on and sing something for me, Miss Kyle. There is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. Today's your day. Come on. The greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. The greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done here. You're the God of this city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are. You're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. The greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done here. God still wants to do greater things in your life, friend. Don't leave it undone with Him. Don't leave it undone with Him. I'm going to pray for you, then I'm going to dismiss you to your families today. Don't leave things undone with God. He wants you to walk in newness of life. It doesn't have to be the way that it is. He wants you to walk in the power of His resurrection. And to know Him. And for things to be different. Father, we love You and thank You for Your Son. We thank You for what You've done through the shedding of His blood and the resurrecting of Him from the dead. We thank You that we can have newness of life. And I ask, Lord, that we would hold ourselves back from that. That we would respond. Pull us out of our caves. Let us stand in the light of Your glorious Gospel. Let the saints be the salt and the light. Let us help us get the grave clothes off of the ones that have come to you and teach them how to walk this walk. Well, Lord, I ask today that through the remainder of this day, even going into the night, that our minds would be on you. For those that didn't respond, they know they should have. Lord, I pray that you would bug them today. That they just wouldn't be able to sit still. 
make it uncomfortable. The reason I want them to be uncomfortable is not to be ugly, Lord. It's This is eternity. It's eternity. And we don't know when our time's coming. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. It's eternity. So be in our mind and in our hearts all day today, Lord. Let us glorify you in all that we do. And God, please continue to move in our lives. Bless our day today with our families. Use us as witnesses to the people in our families that may not know you. And let us be back in the house of God together on Wednesday. We thank you for it, God. We give you all the praise and all the glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. God bless you. If you've got to go, you're dismissed. We love you. Go ahead and worship to you. Take this out of here. Death is going like I got. There is no one like you, God. There is no one like I got. There is no one like God. And greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. And greater things have yet to come.